Thanks for joining me here at the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Looking forward to an educational and helpful, timely interview with pro trainer Jordan Horak of Cato Outdoors. Yeah, we'll learn a little bit about his product line, but mainly we'll learn about how to get our dogs to function better, starting within about a 10-foot diameter circle. Yeah, I'm intrigued, and I hope you are too. But that's not all we'll talk about today. We'll uh, talk about the Upland Nation glossary. We're to the letter L, plenty of L's there. So if you're looking for information, go to L. And we'll also have a public access destination on our new road trip feature. And some comments from all of you on who you wish you'd taken hunting one more time. It's a discussion about all the things important to us, birds, dogs, field work, camaraderie. It's all here on the Upland Nation podcast, so settle down and enjoy. We're made possible in part by Roughland Performance Kennels, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, the Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota, and of course, our new initiative, the Fur Feathers Friends.com project. Whew. Well, it's been a well an interesting time around here. Trying to stretch out the training, uh, both in uh, locations and distances, uh, the kind of the the ultimate iteration of what Jordan and I will be talking about in just a couple minutes. But first off, I lost Flick temporarily, and thank goodness I had my GPS collar. Now, interestingly, what happened, we, we, as, as you might know, we live uh, right on the, I, literally my backyard is a national forest, and that's where we do a lot of our training, especially the conditioning work. And um, uh, as a matter of course, as a habit, I always use a GPS collar because the brush is high, the trees are tall, and it's very thick cover out there. So you really can't see your dog a lot of the time. So uh, I'm I'm used to him ranging, and he's a big ranger for a wire here. He'll do, a, you know, in a chucker hunt, he'll do a 600, 700-yard cast, and I'm used to that. But when I looked at the GPS, he was at 150 yards, and I could still see a flick of his tail every once in a while because he's got that white tip on it. And uh, so I'm okay. And then I turn around and look at the GPS maybe 30 seconds later, and he's at 750 yards. And he's at 890 yards. And then he's at 0.6 miles. And he's heading for the one stinking cinder cone in the whole neighborhood. And sure enough, the screen craps out on me. Not the whole screen, just the little indicator that says, hey, we lost the signal with Flick. So I head in that direction, blowing the whistle frantically. Nothing is happening. He's not coming my way. Um lost track of him literally so after about 10 minutes of that and waiting for him to hopefully come my direction i don't see any action there's a forest service road in between him and where i think i he where i am and where i think he is so i'm getting a little panicky it's got a lot of traffic uh you know certain times a day certain days so i head back to the house <clears throat> saddle up the electric motorcycle and head for that spot but in the meanwhile i make sure what i do is i turn off and then i turn on the handheld version of of the gps collar so it's uh searching again maybe a little bit more aggressively i i don't know how that technology works but i thought it might help put that in the pocket bring a leash along get on the motorcycle head for the spot where i last had confidence he might have been along the way i stop and here's a gal loading in two short hairs um into uh, her truck so i tell her about the story she is kind enough thank you julia for uh to to be willing to climb up onto that cinder cone and look from there and then call me if anything happens so i say sure please do and here's my phone number etc etc i swing around as i'm headed to the far side of that cinder cone i run into a couple guys on dirt bikes tell them the same thing they tell me the same thing 
and uh, get to that far end where, son of a gun, the signal comes back. Not only that, but Flick is only about 450 yards from me where I straddle that bike on the far side of the cinder cone. I'm blowing my brains out. Being a former tuba player, I got a little bit more volume in me than a lot of people, so that whistle is going a mile a minute, and sure enough, I'm looking at the screen on that GPS handheld, and it is the distance is closing, closing, closing. There's one house on a high spot on that side. As I point the GPS in the right direction, here he comes over the rise from the backyard of that house couldn't you know the feeling of course you do you've had it before if you haven't it is the only positive to come out of this whole situation that is you can finally breathe again and sure enough he hears me he finally is able to see me from that little knob he heads in my direction and the happy ending takes place a moment or two later well tell you I've said it before. In fact, I wrote a piece in a magazine just recently about not one regret. I did have one, and I mentioned it in there, and that is that I didn't buy a GPS collar a long time ago. Thank goodness I do have several now, and thank goodness they work. Let's hear it for technology, at least this time around. Oh. Well, speaking of thick cover, south of Duluth, Minnesota, in northern Wisconsin, is the Douglas County Forest. It's a haven for rough grouse hunters. I've been there, battled my way through the publicly accessible, carefully managed mixed-age timber, which also has miles of walking paths for you rough grouse and woodcock hunters. I have the scars to prove it. It's a wonderful place to go if you're looking for early season roughies and the occasional woodcock, depending on timing of the migration. If you're looking for a publicly accessible spot that is managed for people like us, head for the Douglas County Forest in northern Wisconsin. And we are brought to you by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, crafted at the highest caliber. Sign up for the mailing list. Get first notice on sales and new products coming down the pike. Always free shipping. Whether you need hardware, tools, cases, you name it, anything to do with gun care, they've got it. Go to sageandbreaker.com. Take a look at some of the videos I can almost guarantee you're going to learn something. And LegacySports.com is where you find all the information on pointer shotguns, including some of the newer models like the Acrius that I just got. You can also take a look at the 2022 catalog online, or you can order one free. Get a hard copy, put it on the coffee table, and start shopping. They've got a full line of shotguns at LegacySports.com, all under the pointer label. Semi-autos, over-and-unders, youth guns, high-end entry-level target, field guns, and all of them are available in that Cerakoted finish in multiple colors. LegacySports.com Well, I was intrigued with uh, the concept, and that's why I thought we should talk with Jordan Horak. Jordan uh, might be known to you for his company, Cato Outdoors. He might be known to you as a trainer, trialer, spaniel guy, and everything else. Uh, Maybe you saw him at a recent Ducks Unlimited uh, event. We're going to talk about all of that and more, hopefully, so that we become better dog trainers. Jordan, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. You know, uh, we've not met. I, uh, as many people know, I, I write for everybody in one one way, shape, or form. And I was looking for a piece of my own 
because I thought I said something pretty brilliant in it and I needed to find it again. And I found your piece instead on, in, on gundog dot, let's see, gundogmag.com. Uh, and the idea okay. of a, an imaginary 10 foot circle is going to be the basic jumping off point. But before we get to that, which intrigues me, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. I mean, pretty simple. I have a bunch of spaniels. I started really just acquiring spaniels to have hunting dogs. That was probably, I think my first one I got like 2008. Prior to that, I had a lab, a Labrador retriever. And then I hunted with those cockers for a handful of years. And then I started to get into trials and I, I found the trials like as a way to get better as a train, as a trainer and really to like quantify how I was doing with my training. And it was also uh, just an outlet for my competitive spirit. So I started trialing, I think like fall of 2014, maybe I ran in one trial. And then the spring of 2015, I started to hit the trials harder. And I ended up, I mean, I've, I've gone through a lot of dogs. I was really on a quest to win the nationals. And in 2018, I won the amateur nationals in the spring with a dog named Breeze. And then in the fall of that year, I won the open nationals out in New York with a, a dog named Cato. And, uh, you know, there's, I mean, there's a ton of stuff in between there, lots of dogs, lots of learning. I mean, it, it's really been like, uh, it's been a journey for sure. My training, like if I saw myself as a trainer 10 years ago, it would be very, very different than where I'm at today. Um, and then, you know, to, you know, bring it to the present, uh, 2019, I started a company called Cato Outdoors, which we manufacture a platform like a physical platform or place board the industry might think of it as um started manufacturing this place ball place board that we call a cato board and uh, now it's really you know we jump forward to i guess we're into 2022 now and that's really my full-time gig is these dog training products i still own probably 10 cockers of my own i still have cato i still have breeze and then i have some younger ones maybe a couple older ones and um i'm not trialing as much anymore now i'm really just enjoying training my dogs, learning some different things with dogs. I have a, a Belgian Malinois that I got last year, having some fun with him. And then I'm really like, I mean, we'll jump into this, I'm sure. But I'm really intrigued by the idea of all the other dog sports that are out there and how those might yeah. transfer over to hunting dogs. Because I yeah. think uh, it's easy to get siloed and not really uh, be familiar with what else is out there. And there's a lot of overlap with protection dogs and detection dogs and even agility and competitive obedience, like all, all those venues have things that we can definitely adapt into hunting dogs. Oh, I'll never forget. In fact, uh, the, my eyes were opened wide with my first wire hair when I um, heard a guy talking on the radio about French ring sports of all things. Yeah. Well, I called in, of course, had a smart ass question and he, boy, he took me to school. And after that, he, be <laughs> he became a very good friend and a, uh, uh, the first guy to help me train my bird dog of all things. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and the insights he had first off as, as an animal behaviorist and had worked with wolves in one of his other positions, all of a sudden my, I, I, all my notions were dispelled. Sure. Yeah. I, so I look at it. I hope I don't step on any toes here. Cause I am, I mean, at my core, I am a bird hunter. I grew up in Iowa, pheasant hunting. Like I, I for sure am a bird hunter, but an observation that I've made is that in the hunting dog world, a lot of us as hunters, we have, we have dogs because we like to hunt, right? We don't, we don't hunt because we have a dog in the, so, so our training can kind of be a little bit, hmm, I, I don't want to use the word inferior, but maybe we're not as passionate about training as much as we could be. Or on the flip side, a lot of these other sports like French ring, well, we do French ring because we have, because we love dogs and we want a venue or we want an outlet for that dog or agility. You know, we don't love agility. So we get a dog, we have a dog and we do agility because we have that dog. So we're kind of, so a lot of those other venues, people are coming at it from the other side. Like as a hunter, typically we have a dog cause we like to hunt for these other dog sports. Typically they do those sports because they have a dog, if that makes sense. So I think yeah. some of them are a little bit more passionate about just the nuts and bolts of training because that's what they're doing it for. I, I, Whereas I, hunters typically are passionate about hunting. 
I, I think to a great degree that's true, although I, I come from the other side of things, and I know a lot of other people do as well. The reason we hunt is to watch our dogs. Now, that's different than training our dogs, so I, I you know there's a distinction there. And it, by the way, French ring sport, uh, for, for lack of a, a, a concise definition, to think about shutsun training, and, and you know, I, I don't want to call it attack dog training, but I'll call it that. No, it's, but, it's protection dogs yeah. that have a really high level of obedience. There you go. All right. So, yeah. so uh, like all those others, you know, they're running over stuff and jumping on things and grabbing guys by the arms. Hopefully they have enough padding there, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, anyway, George Quinlan, thank you for uh, keeping me steady on all of that stuff. And, <laughs> uh, and, um, and we're all here because we do love dogs. I mean, that's the purpose yeah. of this podcast to a great degree is we, we are the ones in, in the vast universe of bird hunters who really do love going out mm-hmm. because we love watching dogs. So let's go to you, Cockers versus Springers. Why'd you settle on them? Oh man, you're really you're putting me on the spot now. Um, Don't worry, I, there the, your other dogs are not listening. Okay, first, so we're just talking to cocker people now, and, <laughs> and no dogs. So, so I my first cocker, I bought her because I was living in an apartment in just outside of Des Moines, Iowa, and the Labrador Retriever that I had had through high school died while I was in college, and I needed I needed another hunting dog, but I didn't have a lot of space. And I'm a bit of an impulsive person, and I read I read one article in a magazine about cocker spaniels and how they were good hunting dogs and they were small, so they were perfect for apartment life. And based off that one article, sight unseen, I went and bought a field bred English cocker spaniel, and I thought she was the most amazing dog ever until I got my next one, and then I realized uh, she wasn't. You know, it's all relative for sure, <laughs> and. Uh, so so cock the thing about cockers like they're really addictive their personalities they're, it's just a different type of dog like they have a lot of energy but they're always trying to feed off of you and they're they're super intelligent they have lots of quirks uh, a lot of people i think that like to train with a system you know they want to just go from point a to point z and they want to do it consistently every mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. i think they really struggle with cockers because cockers have like so many nuances to them and that personality can, and intelligence can be really good if you get it to work for you it can be really bad if you have too much structure so it, it fits in well with my training and to be honest like i've i've owned a handful of springers at this point i don't own any right now but i have had some and every time I'm like Damn, i don't know i just can't really I can't get into the Springers quite like I am with the Cockers. Like I just, I enjoy the Cockers more from a, from a hunting standpoint. I think there's conditions where a Cocker is better than a Springer. And then also there's going to be times where a Springer might be better than a Cocker. You know, they they have their strengths and weaknesses Um, for like a grouse dog and woodcock hunting, you know, when you're in the woods and maybe in an Aspen cut, you're down in the tag alders, a Cocker is just, I mean, they're, they're just really good at getting under stuff and over and under and around. And they're, they're a real quick, agile little dog. And, uh, I mean, I, I love, I really do love hunting grouse and woodcock. Now, I know pheasants were my first love. I probably like grouse hunting more now. And just watching those cockers go through that those thick brambles and, you know, oh, the, yeah. the, the things in the woods. Now, if I was going to be going out to the Dakotas all the time and I'm busting cattails, I maybe a springer would be better. You know, sometimes the bigger dogs get beat up more in the really heavy cover because they're pushing through it Mm -hmm. and the cockers are going underneath of it. And especially like when you're going through the cattails, you know, you know, those cattails were like, you feel like you could just lean up against the cattails and take a rest if you wanted to, because they're so thick. I have Um, on national television. Yeah. Oh yeah. Perfect. (laughs) And if you fall over in it, you're probably not getting back up. That sort of thing. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes those little cockers, they get down like on the muskrat trails underneath. Yeah. And those muskrat trails, that's where the pheasants are running too. And you can't you can't see the cocker because it's it's not pushing through the cover. So it's not shaking the cover. You know, it's not really creating noise from running through the brush or through the, the cattails. 
But then all of a sudden a bird gets up and you know right where your dog is. I love it. And then another one, I mean, it could be a little bit of a mess hunting in that, but I have found sometimes the smaller cockers actually have more endurance and do better in those heavy cattails because they're underneath running where the animals run oh, they're I, not pushing through it no i agree i remember back when um when people at high-end lodges first started um pairing a pointing breed with a with a cocker spaniel and that was well after they were trying the same thing with labradors and this was okay. in florida at a really high, in fact jimmy buffett had hunted the same place with the same guide the week before i'm uh, pretty sure i've never hunted there so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i'll <laughs> never be invited back uh, don't ask why but uh but so i finally cornered the guide and i said well you know why not do like everybody else does and like you probably did three five years ago and he says well listen watch the dogs the next time we go and this is uh, florida plantation kind of hunting so it's palmettos sure. and uh, you know uh open ground and then a thick spot uh a patch of thick spot where the birds are hanging out these are bob whites and so okay. we get a point the cocker goes in like you just described so low they're not dealing with most of that obstacle mm -hmm. because they're under mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. the other benefit with the quail was those birds go straight up because the bird is literally right at their level pushing them straight up into the air as opposed to out the other side of the palmettos for example okay okay so uh, almost a it, safety issue there but a wonderful yeah. wonderful way to put bob whites into the air yeah well if you think it like the best visual if you think about when you go into the woods there's a canopy that you're walking under right like you're not pushing through the branches you're down by the trunks of the trees right so it's more it's more open there's always a canopy like even with the grass in your yard there's a bit of a canopy if you got down low enough right like yeah. ants at the bottom of the grass are not pushing through the, the grass they're going around the stem of those of the grass right sure so a, a cocker when it's going through four foot cover it's low enough that it's dealing with the stem or the trunk it's not dealing with all the the foliage up at the top where the branches and you know all that so so they are more of a, I don't know, they're like, it's like a little weasel sometimes, you know, they're just threading their way through that stuff and they're not, they're not pushing it over as much. I never, now, I have had cocker, the cocker breed is kind of interesting because you don't have a lot of standardization. There's a lot of different colors. Mm -hmm. Colors don't really matter at all. Yes, they and do. A lot of, by the way, the well, only cocker okay. for me is that that lightish brown color and if i ever get one okay. somebody wants to bring me one that's my <laughs> color choice please i mean if i had my preference it might be a black one i really <sighs> the black ones i do like but but honestly i just i like a, a hard going mm -hmm. biddable cocker regardless of color but yeah. some of them part of that like not having a, a great standardization in the breed means that you can have a really small one. Like my daughter owns one that's, I think she's 15 months old. The dog, not my daughter. <laughs> and that, that dog, I mean, it's, maybe call it a puppy, maybe call it a dog it's in between. It's probably 18 pounds right now. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's, I call it to irritate my daughter. I call it the little rodent. <laughs> she loves, um, but then I've had them also where they're as big as like 38 pounds. Oh, I know. So I've, there's, I, I've, I've dealt with some that I thought were springers. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, again, if I had my preference, I wouldn't want them that big. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to me, a, a 38 pound cocker, maybe you should just get a Springer because mm -hmm. now you're really up in that Springer size. Yeah. Uh, if I had my preference, I'd say, hey, probably a 30 pound male and a 22 to 25 pound female is about about where I want to be, maybe. But, but again, if it's a hard going dog that, is biddable and can go go side you know it doesn't really matter that much i guess you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden the host that's jordan horak with cato outdoors and and your website address is the same isn't it jordan yep it's cato c-a-t-o outdoors.com great um and we'll get to that name in a moment because you're too young to remember a 
lot of the questions that I'm going to ask later. But um, like OJ Simpson, <laughs> no way beyond okay. that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Although I was there for that. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, but you, 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 we're talking a good game, but we're talking all around the most important part, and that is the the hunting side of things. So, so tell me, you know, what, how did your season go? I'll, I'll tell you, grouse hunting was pretty tough in Wisconsin this mm-hmm. past fall. Mm-hmm. You know, we've we've dealt with some pretty low numbers the last two or three years. Yeah. And I was hoping, you know, based on some things I'd heard from friends in Michigan, it seemed like their season turned around in 2020 and population seemed to be better. I was hoping that 21 in Wisconsin would maybe follow Michigan. And it just, it wasn't like we, we found some birds, but not nearly the numbers that we had found previously. So we still got out there. We still shot some and, you know, it's not really, if you're grouse hunting to shoot a bunch of birds, you probably should find a different hobby. <laughs> so it's, it's it's typically not overly productive as far as putting birds in the bag, but we, we saw enough to keep us out there. And like we talked about at the start of the podcast, a lot of it is just going out and running dogs and not going through the motions, but finding other things to enjoy besides just seeing birds and putting birds in the bag. Well, the last time I was out in that country, um, uh, in a place that I mentioned earlier in the opening to the show, Douglas County Forest in that country out in that area, I had as much luck, well, luck being relative, uh, <laughs> with with woodcock. And, yeah. Uh, and it was just yep. one of those days, I guess. Uh, but did so, you, did so you the run? woodcock. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. So did you run into many this past season? No. Woodcock are interesting because they're migratory. Yeah. And, and it's really hit or miss. Like if you get into a flight of woodcock, it can be un- unbelievable. I mean, it, like I've had days where I probably put up 150 to 200 woodcock. Now that doesn't happen often. Like you have, to, you know, you timed it at the right, it was perfect timing. You were on mm-hmm. the right day mm-hmm. in the right cover and it was bird after bird after bird. And really that just turns into a training situation because you, you can only shoot three woodcock and, I may not be the greatest shot, but if I have 150 chances, um, you know, you get your limit really, really quickly. So it really turns into just running multiple dogs, giving them all turns, and every once in a while shooting a bird to reward a dog. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we did get into some woodcock. I honestly don't really target them. Um, I, I kind of prefer grouse hunting a little bit later in the season. Like to me, November is the best time to get out there, maybe mm-hmm. late October but a lot of times the woodcock has started to move on by then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, so what is it about that late, everything being relative, that later part of the season, is it because the cover is more clear or is there something yes. else involved? Yeah. The cover, I don't really like hunting with green cover yeah. underneath. It just, to me, that's not, it's not as enjoyable. Like I like it when everything starts to die out underneath and, the leaves start to fall so you can see the birds a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I don't really, you know, those, those warm October days where it's 75 degrees out, that's hard on the dogs, yeah. especially yeah. If they're pushing through green cover. And it's just, I, I don't, you know, there's, there's only so many days that you get to go hunting every year. And I like to, to maximize those opportunities, I guess, like rather than, so this is going to be a parallel from a different type of hunting, but I, I always remember back to, I used to be a deer hunter, not so much anymore. And I remember getting, you know, October one comes around and bow season opens and we guys would start hitting it really hard. You know, you're out there a couple times a week, maybe three times a week sitting in that tree stand. And then by the time the rut rolled around and the hunting was actually getting really good, you kind of burned out because you sat in the tree for so many hours already. And then you don't, <laughs> you wouldn't hunt half as hard during the rut as you did at the start of the season. Cause mm-hmm. you were either you were burned out or you'd, you'd kind of used your kitchen passes or whatever you want to call it um, yep. put it yep. that way. Yep. And you know, like, well, I probably can't be gone hunting three, three times this week. And that parallel with bird hunting, you know, a lot of times at the start of the season, you're, you're chomping at the bit to get out there and you hit it hard, but it's not always, it's not always the best time to be hunting. And maybe, you know, I, I might do some other things a little bit in October, wait for things to, for the cover to die off, and then and then hit it a little bit harder in November. Wow, 
Yeah, I, I understand for all of those reasons. Uh, I, I know there are people out there listening, and I'm I'm one of them too, who just ha- got to be there on opening day. I don't care how much you do, yep. you got to be there. Yep. And then um, we're lucky enough to have a long, long season out here in the West, depending on what you're willing to walk for and hunt for. And, okay. Uh, Still haven't worn out my welcome, so I'm um, going to keep doing a long, <laughs> a long version of it. We don't have the other thing. We don't have out in, in most of the West. If we're hunting roughies, for there's no such thing as woodcock out here. But the the roughies okay. out here are in the conifer forest, so the, the leaves never fall. Okay. So, so we don't have to worry about that aspect of yeah. timing <laughs> as well. Um, you know, oh, it's speaking of timing, which leads to distance, which leads to training, which leads to the original impetus for this call, which is we're going to talk about this. Um, I, I'm calling it a 10 foot circle. You call it a 10 foot principle and, and the whole idea of how to train using that as one of your guides. And we're going to get back into that in a few minutes as well. Um, we're also everybody going to uh, come up to the letter L in the Upland Nation glossary. I got a word for you that you might want to use at that proverbial cocktail party on Saturday night. Plus, um, I asked you on uh, social media who you wish you had hunted with one more time, and I'm fascinated by some of your responses. We'll cover all of that and way more with Jordan Horak of Cato Outdoors Dog Training. Uh, is spaniels but a lot of this is um, applicable to any dog and that's what got me excited about talking with him it'll all be coming up right after a quick break jordan relax for a moment and i'll make a couple announcements and then we'll be back at it first from audio cardio.com thank you if you participated in our who's your hero um promotion we got some winners to announce very soon for that app a 12 months free subscription to the app yeah that's right on your phone improve your hearing it's a wellness app for your ears no appointments no visits to anybody else it's easy and convenient just plug in your earbuds and go about your day you can get a 14-day free trial i don't care if you were part of the promotion or not 14-day free trial see how it works watch the two-minute video at audiocardio.com and if you're one of those family guys who's got to have a suv or something along those lines for your daily driver and your hunting rig rufflandkennels.com has the dog crate for you they call it the slant back and just like everything else they develop it is built around principles that make your life easier your dog's life easier and you keep your dog safer in the rig it's a dog crate roto molded and remember they're the pioneers in roto molding at ruffland kennels that fits right snug up against the front seats of your suv it's kind of slants a little bit gives your dog as much room as possible but saves space in the back for well all that other important stuff like shotguns coolers oh maybe another dog box learn more about the slant back and everything else they offer in the way of crates accessories and particularly i love their water storage uh, version you know they got a little of everything in that regard rough r-u-f-f rough land kennels.com and we're back at the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden with any luck listening on the other end of this telephone connection is jordan horak from cato outdoors jordan thanks yep, for sticking here. around appreciate that enjoy talking about well any kind of hunting or any kind of dog work from shoot soon to agility and you're absolutely right we could we you and i together could probably make up a hundred agility d- jokes couldn't we <laughs> if you've ever been to an agility trial folks you know what i mean <laughs> but, but but god love them and uh, and we joke about around here flick would be a good agility my wire hair uh he would be a good okay. agility dog he just loves that kind of stuff but um i can't get him trained up enough on the bird work yet <laughs> there you go you know you, you yeah it, and it's really just the print i mean it doesn't matter what the dog sport is but it's just the principle that yeah, boy, there's a lot of things out there that we can learn from. Yeah. And it's good to be open-minded. 
It it truly is, and and you know, uh, I got to just remind a lot of people that that you know, for example, um, a lot of the great dog trainers we know them as dog trainers. Uh, some of us know them as rodeo gate men who uh, made their bones training freaking horses, for example. Mm-hmm. And Delmar, thank you for the kind words. Um, Delmar Smith, it's the guy I'm talking about, and he's a legend in sure. in our minds and in in our time. But there are others out there too who who kind of learned from other critters, not just other mm-hmm. dog sports, for example. Uh, but let's let's get back to you and and what you're doing first. I just lay this place board thing on me. You've got the the world's greatest place board. That, you know, so tell sure. me tell me why that you think that's so important. Yeah, so I it back I think it was 2013, a guy that I knew was like, "Hey, you should try using place boards for training." And I, I know I originally blew him off cuz I couldn't in my head it didn't make sense to me how a, a static object, the platform just sitting there was going to help me like make a better field trial dog. You know, something like a hard charging dog, how does this platform help with that? So Eventually, I gave in, and I made a couple of them. And back in the day, we just make them out of two-by-fours, throw some plywood on top, put a piece of carpet on it. And so I made a couple of them, and I threw them in my backyard, and I went back there with the dogs. And I was I was amazed the two trial dogs I had at the time. They weren't actually actively trialing yet, but I was getting them ready for trials. Sure. It was Rocky and, Rocky and Breeze. And they both – they went and jumped on them and sat on them and looked at me like they'd been doing it their whole lives. I mean, it was – honestly i it was bizarre like how they gravitated to these platforms so quickly and at the start now now place board training has been around for a long time like back in the 80s guys were doing this it just wasn't it, it wasn't popular at the time it wasn't really well known but guys were doing it back then it's evolved so initially it used to be just let's just teach steadiness with that platform because this the platform elevates the dog a little bit off the ground it gives it this very well-defined spot that that's where you're supposed to stay. And it, and it really does make it a lot easier to steady a dog, you know, to teach a dog to wait, to be sent for a retrieve later to, to be steady to the flush. So we used to just use it for that, like sit there until I send you to go do a retrieve. And, and they work extremely well for that. Platform training has evolved though, over the last, I, I don't know, it, it, it's constantly evolving. But now it's more like we can use it to teach steadiness for sure, but we can also use it more as like a, just a checkpoint on the way to a final destination. So we don't necessarily always want the dog to just go and sit there. Sometimes we just want the dog to go and touch it. So if we're teaching handling, now handling can be used for blind retrieves. It can also be used for a flushing dog as it's going through the field. Handling on a blind retrieve is going to be Generally, it's going to be at a farther distance. Sure. Handling um, while while coursing or quartering through the field is going to be at a closer distance. But the principle is the same, where we want that dog to take a hand signal and either go to our left or go to our right, maybe go a little farther away from us, maybe come a little bit closer to us. So now we can use those platforms. Once the dog is familiar with it and it knows that that platform is a, is a place to go for good things to happen, we can teach that dog to go from one platform to the next. And while it's doing that, it's, it's looking for its reward. You know, so we're, I mean, this is, boy, this is going to turn into a rabbit hole here. Maybe we can jump down it really quickly. Go ahead. But okay. So I look at, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but there's two, two main ways that we can train anything, whether it be people or animals, we can either force an animal to do something or we can force a person to do something. Or we can encourage them to do it by giving them a reward when they do the right behavior. But we can we can never put an electric collar on a human. Well, I mean, (laughs) says who? (laughs) Okay, but (sighs) but but think. I mean, so I can force a dog to get onto a platform. I get it against its will. Sure. Or I can teach that dog that when it gets on the platform, something good happens. Okay. Yeah. And and that's operant conditioning, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, when I when I do this, I get the response that I want, whatever that is, whether it's a, a retrieve or whether it's a treat. When I do this, I get that. That's a way better mindset for a dog to learn 
than a dog that's being forced to do something. And that's, th this should be a really easy concept for people to understand because we're the same way as humans. Like, I don't want to be forced to do something. And if I am being forced to do something, I'm probably not going to give it 100% of my effort. There's, I'm always going to be a little spiteful about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was forced to do it. If, on the other hand, I was rewarded for doing something, now I'm actually going to offer that behavior on my own because I want the result that comes with offering that behavior. And that's a, now, I'm, now I'm fully engaged in it and I'm giving 100%. Because the faster I do it and the better I do it, the faster I get my reward. Yeah, right? and it, absolutely. I, in fact, so, I was reading just last night again about a great Mo Lindley is the name of a trainer that uh, that I've, okay. I've just been exposed to. Uh, same philosophy, different uh, style. We're talking about pointing dogs here, but the idea yep. is is absolutely the same. So, so the big question, and here's the nexus for these boards is you got a dog you want that dog to let's just say you want it to work within range and you got a cocker so you're you know hoping it's within 20 yards of you most of the time do you use it in a case like that and if you do how how yeah okay so so the article that you referred to at the start the the 10 foot principle i think is how i titled it yeah, or the 10 yeah. foot rule or something like that the the concept there is if we can teach things in a small space and we can teach them very literally now we have something that we can go out in the field with and we can enforce it or we can encourage it but we have a foundation to work off of yeah and so from a quartering standpoint you know they say necessity is the mother of invention and i used to i mean that's really how how i developed a lot of this some of it i learned from others some of it i developed on my own i'm not going to take credit for all of it or anything but I lived in town. I didn't have a lot of resources as far as land goes, nor did I have a lot of resources as far as money goes. So I had to find a way to, to train these dogs kind of on a shoestring budget while in town. And what I, what I learned was most of the things that dogs do out in the field can be taught in a really small space. You know, we're not really asked from a training standpoint. We don't ask these dogs to do a lot. We ask them to come when they're called. We might ask them to sit to the flush or if it's a pointing dog, we ask it to be you know, steady to the flush. Not everybody does that, but that's, that's one thing we might train for. We typically want them to sit when we tell them to sit. We want them to stay there until we send them for a retrieve, especially if we're a duck hunter. And a lot of these dogs obviously are dual purpose, mm -hmm. um, you know, pheasant, grouse, ducks, goose, whatever. Um, and then beyond that, like a lot of times we want them to heal but really, we're not asking these dogs to do a bunch of complex things. We can boil it down to a few simple functions. And most of those things can be taught in a backyard or down at the park or in a really small space. So that's, yeah. that was what I learned was I can teach a dog to quarter just by casting it to one side to a, a Kato board or a place board. And then I can cast it the other direction to another Kato board. And then I mark that behavior with a retrieve. So you go touch one, you touch touch the other, here's a retrieve. Uh, oh, okay, I can uh, do that. You know, in the dog's head. So now the dog starts offering those behaviors, going from one to the next, back and forth, waiting waiting for its reward, which which would be that retrieve. And then eventually maybe we take the platforms or the Kato boards out of the equation mm -hmm. and we throw a retrieve off to one side, send the dog for it. Then we send the dog again. There's no retrieve. So we toot toot, send it to the other side, nothing there, send it to the other side. And while it's going the one direction, we roll a tennis ball or a dummy out to the side that it just left. Yeah. And now when it comes back, voila, there's a tennis ball there or there's a dummy. So now it just, again, operant conditioning. Huh. When I offered this behavior, when I quartered back and forth, every once in a while, there's a paycheck for me. So I could literally stand in my backyard, cast the dog off. And I didn't have a big backyard. It was just big enough for a dog to run a quartering pattern. And and I just have that dog quarter right in the backyard. I'm not going. I'm just staying where I'm at. Sure. But the dog is quartering. And so, and, well, so now when I go out in the field, mm -hmm. you know, on the weekend or wherever, now I'm not teaching the dog how to take hand signals and quarter. The dog learned how to, in my backyard, the dog learned how to take hand signals and to quarter with me. 
now I'm just teaching that dog more distance. Cause really like in the backyard, the dog's running too flat. If anything, like I kind of want them to be a little farther out. And when I go out in the field, well, that's pretty easy to condition, whether it's, you know, if I'm using training birds, maybe I let the dog see the birds go in or I run the dog into the wind. So it's smelling the birds down the course and that's naturally going to get them to open up a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the key to all of those, and I, I get them and it's, it's brilliant it, it is, and by the way, I'm old enough to remember when place boards were a new thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the key to all of this is the, the, when you go beyond the 10 foot circle and you start adjusting distances and and new locations yeah. obviously and things like that yeah so is there any one piece of advice for when we go from the yard to the park yes so the biggest piece of advice is if you cannot get the behavior that you want in your backyard mm-hmm. you're most likely not going to get that behavior in the park and you're for sure not going to get that behavior when you go out into the field so a uh, we, we typically are enthusiastic about our dogs and we want to give them more and more. And a lot of times that can, can backfire on us because if the dog, if the dog doesn't know what's expected of it, and then we add distractions and sometimes we add accelerants, i.e. like a bird <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't help the dog to learn because it just starts to, it distracts the dog or it creates such a high level of excitement that the dog's not in a learning mindset. So yeah. I always like that 10 foot circle is basically, Hey, get everything right within 10 feet of you before, before you start to open it up. Cause if you can't get what you want inside of 10 feet, like if the dog won't sit for you when it's within that 10 foot circle, it's sure not going to sit for you out in the field when it's 30 yards away. Yeah. It's not going to get, magically better in the field no or if the dog won't come to you when it's inside that 10 foot circle it's sure not going to come when you call it when you're out in the field and it's 50 yards away so get those things dialed in in your backyard even in your living room for that matter like maybe you need to make it even smaller but get those things sorted out get that working relationship with your dog like i'll tell you i've had a lot of sessions where all I worked on was having the dog sit and look at me. Mm-hmm. That was it. I, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I'm even out in the field and I'm expecting to like quarter this dog through the field, but it won't just sit and give in to me and look at me. Well, the last thing that dog needs is for me to say, ah, you know what? I'm going to have to work on that later, but let's go run through this field. Well, remember like operant conditioning can work good and bad, right? Yeah, so but, well, they're is, always learning. You said it in that always, article, and it's you know, as a former teacher, I understand that absolutely. Always. So, so if I, if I'm out in the field and this dog is chomping at the bit to go, and it's vocalizing, it's whining, maybe it's barking, it's spinning around, it's jumping, it's doing everything except sitting and looking at me. If I cast that dog off, what did the dog learn? It learned that jumping and spinning and yipping and whining and all that one of those things got me to cast it off that's what it thinks in its head so guess what it's going to do next time it's going to offer that same behavior because last time we taught it that those behaviors get it what it wants yeah but on on the flip side if i spend 10 minutes just getting that dog to calm down and relax and you can see the more time you spend with dogs you can see it in their face like their ears will start to drop a little bit their expression softens and they start to connect with you more. If I stay there and wait until I see that, you know, until I see that dog just relaxed and sitting and looking at me and then I cast the dog off again, operant conditioning. Like what did we just teach the dog when it gets to that state of mind? That's when it gets what it wants. So next time I'm going to be able to hopefully get to that state of mind more quickly. Oh yeah. You know, I'm I'm thinking about so many analogies. The first one is when you have a junior high school band, and they all have noisemakers in their hands, and you want quiet. The first thing I would do is I'd stand on the podium, and then of course the classic is you tap your baton on the music. Okay, all of us. That's it. then I wait for them all to look at me. Okay, that was the old days. The new days. Okay. Uh, um, now I take a dog and I, I walk. Uh, the first thing we do out uh, when the tailgate drops and the dog is on still on a lead, 
we do three or four little tiny obedience drills. And then I remember Mm -hmm. a writer years ago, he said, yeah, before my dog goes anywhere into the field, I make him hold a woe. Okay. All of those things are doing exactly what you just described. And that is getting that dog to focus on what you want it to focus on. Um, Mm -hmm. And largely they are obedience related uh, expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And um, and the other thing is when I'm hunting with a dog, I want that dog to, to be hunting with me. mm -hmm, Right. Like mm -hmm. I, I think anybody that's hunted knows the difference. Like there's one dog that's out there and like, it never makes eye contact and it's, it's hunting for itself completely. And then the next dog, you can tell it's checking in, it's trying to work for the gun more. There's more of a connection there. I, I want that when I'm hunting with a dog, I really want that dog thinking that all good things come from me and that this is a teamwork event. Basically that's a lot more enjoyable. And if, if we start out with an out of control dog inside that 10 foot circle, it's, we're not going to have teamwork when we get outside of that 10 foot circle. So I want that dog to just be working through me, giving me the behaviors that I want at close distance. And then, then when I go to a bigger distance, the expectation has been set, um, bigger distance or an accelerant. So Mm -hmm. again, going Mm -hmm. back to that bird, a lot of times if we don't have a good foundation and then we introduce birds to that dog, the dog loses its mind right? It's doing everything out of control, but because it's a bird and that's a bird dog and we're scared to break our bird dog, we, we let it get away with a lot of things. Well, cause he was smelling a bird or he had a bird in his mouth and I didn't want to, I didn't want to like turn him off to birds. So we let him get away with it. Well, the problem with that is go back to dogs are always learning. Dogs will really quickly learn that there's one set of rules when I'm in the yard and there's another set of rules when I have a bird or when I smell a bird. And if I can make a really good foundation in the backyard in that small space, then when I introduce that accelerant, I I have something to fall back on. And I teach them that, Hey, rules are the exact same, whether it's a tennis ball or it's a pigeon or it's a pheasant, it doesn't matter. The same rules apply. And if I did a good job with my foundation, they understand that really quickly. Even though they're super excited about that bird, they're like, oh, yeah, but I remember how I'm supposed to behave because I was taught. Uh, you, you know, and, and what, what you're describing is, is learning any, any, any sentient being learning any set of skills. Um, I call it the wishful thinking strategy. You know, we, we get a dog to, you know, finally to do what we want it to do. Uh, let's just use a retrieve. So we get the dog to run out, bring it back and hand it over in the yard. Okay. One time Mm -hmm. we think, okay, now he's got it. He's figured it out. You know, then, then, then you're right. We go to South Dakota and all bets are off. Everything yeah. goes off the rails, and, and it's it's because, well, why? You know, gosh, he did so well on that one retrieve in the yard. Yeah. So there's yeah. there's a there's some there's some some uh, nuances in there, and you you've talked about dialing it in, and 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 you know some people say, well, if a dog can do that thing in seven different locations, or uh, I like the mm-hmm. rule of three. If I get three good iterations of whatever we're working on, I quit right there. Don't want to get too much. Don't want them to fold yeah. it in. But yep. are there other things along those lines, you know, that, again, this nexus, you know, when we go to 11 feet, what are the things we need to be more mindful of whenever we're doing this? So how do we yeah. how do we do that? Uh, so I'm not a super literal person. Yeah. If, if we'll use that word. Like, I, I'm not a, a really clearly defined process person. Like, I like to just read the dog in front of me. And some dogs we go faster with. Some dogs we go more slowly with. If it's a, if it's a really high powered, hard charging dog, I'm not at all worried about that dog getting out and running. I'm worried about that dog getting out and running too much. So I'm going to spend way more time with that dog, putting in a foundation and making sure I have that rapport with the dog before I start to kind of give it its head and give it more space. Mm -hmm. If it's a dog that's more meek, maybe, maybe we'll use that word. It's a little bit softer. If if it's a dog, I'm a little, not necessarily concerned, but I know that dog's going to need a little bit more encouragement. 
I might actually not do quite as much foundation work and I might give it a little more space a little more quickly because I don't want to I grind it into the ground, I guess. I don't want to make things so boring for it that it just never really has the style that I want, never runs as hard as I want. So yeah, yeah. The, the one thing about dog training, I mean, your listeners will know this, but do, the cool thing about dogs and the frustrating thing about dogs is that they're all different. So you can't just say, we'll do X, Y, and Z, and voila, you get the finished product that you want. Because it's just not that simple. You know, some dogs are natural retrievers. Some dogs aren't so natural. Some dogs are hard runners. Some aren't so hard running. Some are hard headed. Some are soft. I mean, there's, and they all need to be trained a little bit differently. And I, I like to equate it to children. You know, there's obviously there's been billions and billions of people born in this world. And there's probably millions for sure. There's thousands of books on raising children or rearing children or whatever the word you want to insert there. And we just keep writing those books. Why is that? <laughs> like, well, because there's no one perfect method for raising kids. If there was, there'd just be one book and we would all read it and we would all have kids that are you know, doctors and attorneys or whatever our desired outcome is. But instead, because every kid is different, out of all those billions, there's never been two that were completely identical. It's the same thing for dogs. Like, there's no one perfect way to train a dog. Instead, I like to think of it as we take principles and then we apply those principles based on the dog that's in front of us. And that's where as a, as a dog owner, we need to be more discerning. Like instead of just reading a book and then following it exactly, read a book and take a few things out of it or listen to a podcast, i.e. this one. And maybe you take one or two things out of it, but take, the, but take principles more than taking drills if that makes sense it just yeah it does and train and, the dog in front of you yeah that great and I, i'm going to ask one one more time about something related to that and again i'm looking at some of the trainers of horses that i've worked with over the years okay and and quite often not all the time but the smart ones the ones you respect at the end of the day uh don't do anything for a little while except mm -hmm. wa watch the animal. Uh, maybe they watch somebody else work the animal, but, but even when they're doing that, they're not watching the human, they're watching the horse. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I've been to enough seminars and work with enough pro trainers in the field on the TV show that uh, I, th I think they do the same thing. They're being slightly analytical, uh, vastly more perceptive by simply trying to read the dog and mm -hmm. you're talking about the same thing you're talking about paying attention to what that dog needs wants and is doing and by doing i don't mean he's running from the left to the right at about 14 yards but why it's doing that and what it yeah. expects during that time you mentioned something fascinating to me and i i you know hell i wrote about this uh when was that thing published in 2013 um dogs are always paying attention to you in one way shape or form uh whether they're ignoring what you want them to do or not is the other is is the other side of that same coin mm -hmm. they they always know when you're yelling at them that's right voluntarily they can uh comply or not comply Sometimes yep. they want more direction. Sometimes they want less direction. Sometimes they prefer not to have any, so they do ignore you. Um, yep. but, but you mentioned principles, and I know we talked about um, that, I think, to a degree, but de define some fundamental principles for us. Sure. So my principles would be we mark behaviors that we want just as often or more often than we mark behaviors that we don't want. Yeah. So. I've had my daughter who's really into the dogs probably just as much or maybe even more than me at this point. I used to have, while she would be running her dog, she would, she might verbally scold it if it was, if it was not doing what she wanted and, and then it would do what she wanted and she would just stay silent and not, not say mm -hmm. or do anything. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, Hey, sweetie, like, did he know when he did the wrong thing? Like, yeah. Cause you know, why did he know that? Well, cause I told him, Yep. And then when he did the right thing, did he know that he did the right thing? 
And she's like, I don't, I don't know, I guess. Like, yeah, because you, you didn't tell him. So we have to be sure. It's really easy for us to mark bad behavior. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. It's a lot harder for us to mark the behaviors that we do want. And I would say we should be better at marking good behaviors than we are at marking bad behaviors. Oh, you know, I, so, I, I agree. I mean, when I would, you know, when I'm on, when I'm on location working with a pro hunting guide, for example, um, I ask them all, how much praise versus how much correction? Mm-hmm. And, and, and all the pros who, who are good, who I admire, who work with their dogs and their dogs do a great job, will tell me that it's, oh, five, six, seven times as much praise as correction. Yeah. So, so then this gets a little bit more into the weeds, but there's really two – like we can mark behavior. So mm-hmm. you, I'm sure you're familiar with clicker training. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and really all clicker training is it's, uh, to me, it's as much for the trainer as it mm-hmm. is for the dog. Mm-hmm. That clicker reminds us to mark the behavior that we want. Mm-hmm. I like that click. I like that click, but there has to be a paycheck that comes with that click. Thank so you. Click, Thank reward. you. <laughs> click reward. Yeah, exactly. So, it's it's easy for us to think that just saying attaboy good dog is a reward for that dog but it, it's not really like i can't take attaboy to the bank and, and cash it in like or the dog can't right the dog it's if we can create a paycheck then we can get more effort like if if i mean if, like, like let's just say hypothetically you came and worked for me with kato outdoors and you were just doing a an amazing job and i i just man scott excellent job good job good job i just kept telling you good job but no paycheck ever came with it <laughs> that's yeah. not really that's not really your language right like yeah. i need a paycheck that comes with that i'm, now, a, I'm already a non-profit by the way <laughs> okay <laughs> but but there has to be the paycheck doesn't have to come as often as good boy but there does have to be paychecks so for a dog i want I need to have a paycheck so that I can pay that dog. There's a couple of different paychecks. One would be treats. Mm-hmm. We use treats more with puppies. Mm-hmm. The problem with treats are that when you start creating more distance, it's hard to give that paycheck. You know, if I ask a dog to sit 50 yards away from me, I can't pay it with a treat because it's too far away. So I need a different paycheck. I like to use a retrieve as the paycheck. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like the way that this developed in my head, I guess, was detection dogs. And I saw these detection dogs that were like frantically searching for a drug. We'll say, let's say they're looking for marijuana and they they're looking, they're not looking. Hey hey man, who isn't, do you know? Well, true. (laughs) They're not, they're not looking for it because they, they want marijuana. They're looking for the marijuana because of the tennis ball or the tug, the toy that they get when they, when they find it right so they're they're offering this really unnatural behavior of looking for marijuana so that they can just chew on their toy basically and if we can treat if we can get our hunting dogs to think that way we're like i'll give you these behaviors if you give me a retrieve well now we can really start to to teach things at a distance so i ask a dog to sit 50 yards away because i taught it inside that 10 foot circle now we're asking at a distance it puts its butt down I can mark that behavior with a paycheck just by throwing a tennis ball to that dog yeah, and it, giving it the retrieve. It, but, go ahead. But, okay, but we have to be really, really careful that we don't overuse that paycheck and create too much familiarity because familiarity creates contempt, right? So if we, if we take a, a retrieving object and we just keep throwing it for that dog, it doesn't create more retrieve drive typically. It will in very rare cases, but – Typically, it creates less retrieve drive because the dog becomes bored with it. So I'll take a puppy and I'll give it like two retrieves with a little tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And then I tease it like I'm going to throw it again. And then I put that tennis ball in my pocket. And that is a session for an entire day, just two retrieves. But then the next day when I pull that tennis ball out, that puppy wants it more. Because last time I interrupted his fun game, I took his toy. Now when I throw it, he has even more intensity and we do so we create more drive by using less and once that drive is kind of ingrained in that dog and we create this like true love for retrieving 
which might be at six months, it might be at nine months, but it's a little bit later in that dog's life. Now I have a tool, I have a paycheck that's a, a silly tennis ball that I can get that dog to offer all sorts of behaviors for. It, it, it is a matter of degree. It's a matter of frequency. Uh, you're on the same page I am. Three is the maximum iteration of any good performance I want out of a dog in training. Um, it all works and and you know you mentioned uh and we're going to talk briefly about no birds no bird dogs isn't quite the whole story there but if there's a collar manufacturer out there who um does this i want my royalties on it i think you need to put a speaker on the dog collar so that the human 150 yards away can speak into the handheld and say good dog good dog and the dog will yeah. hear it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, there's, there's the transition you know, when you can't shoot a bird every time. or, or I know can't. the technology is there because we have a baby monitor. There, there you go. <laughs> so we just need to transfer that to dogs. But, yeah. but there's also like remote treat trainers. So there's like treat dispensers that you hit a button and it drops out a treat. So you mm-hmm. can... I, I have not experimented with that, but in my head, like that makes a ton of sense. Like run to a Kato board that's 50 yards away. And when you go jump on it, I hit the button and there's a treat. You could really quickly have a young dog. Okay. We got to have a long conversation off mic. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's get to the bird thing because, you know, this, again, okay, this, yeah. this is, you know, and again, I was reading it last night again for the umpteenth time. You know, yeah, at some point, you got to kill a bird for that dog, that puppy. Um, you know, he does yeah. all this, he does all that, he does it all right, and then you don't kill a bird. Okay, I get yeah. it. You know, we, we know the phrase, no birds, no bird dogs. Um, it It's absolutely true. The ultimate paycheck for virtually every one of our dogs is a bird in their mouth. That, and it's mm-hmm. it's not going to get it. It's holding it in that mouth and smelling it and tasting it, feeling the feathers and all those are things that we can't we can't we don't understand that stuff. But dogs love yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But there so, you say that's not the be all and the end all. Yeah, so that might be the end game, but if we cheat and go to the end game too quickly, mm-hmm. we're kind of circumventing the whole foundation thing and we're just like we're <laughs> For us, that might be the end all to go out there and shoot a bird and have our dog retrieve it. So we want to get there as quickly as possible. Yeah. But a lot of times there's collateral damage that happens on the way. Like if we, I, I find, I mean, this is slightly anecdotal, but I, on Facebook, you see people all the time with, oh, I have my six month old dog and I shot 200 birds over it this year and he's phenomenal. He's amazing. And I used to have clients who were like, I think my dog's behind because it's nowhere close to doing that. And I would tell them, just wait a year and you'll never see another post about that dog. And 99% of the time that was true. Those dogs that got too much early on, they, it was too much for them. So by the time they became an adult dog, they just, they had no foundation and they had all go and they were no longer, they they were no longer nice dogs to hunt behind. And Mm -hmm. I, I, I equate it to like, again, to children. So I can take a, let's say I, I have four kids. So a little bit of experience with this. I have three older ones, 12, 11, and nine. If I take my boys who are 11 and nine and we go do something like, like we like to go fishing together or they'll go traipsing through the woods with me when I go hunting mm-hmm. right, right now they're young enough that physically they're able to do most of these things with me. But but they're also young enough mentally that they're not really confident enough to go do it on their own. So everything is going through me. So I'm giving them experiences, but they're reliant on me. And I see a six to six month old to say a year old. Those are kind of arbitrary ages, but somewhere in that range, I see those dogs kind of as being young kids that physically they're getting to where they can do these things, but they're still young enough mentally that they're reliant on their owner you know they're not going to go run off and do their own thing because the the confidence isn't there they're still they're still immature mentally but now when that dog gets to a year and a half or two years of age now mentally they just grew up they're really confident in their head and they know how much they like birds 
now they don't feel like they need their owner anymore and they go out and do their own thing and that becomes a disaster. So it looked great mm-hmm. for a while, but when everything grew up, it kind of blew up on us. So I look at birds as, you know, the, the adage is it takes birds to make a bird dog. I agree with that, but it takes birds at the right time. So if I don't have good control of my dog, the last thing I want to do is go give it birds because it's going to create even less control. Yeah, you so, know, we we are the impatient ones in that transaction. For sure. Now, now if I have a dog that just doesn't have a lot of go, not a lot of flash, it's really obedient, it really is with me, but it's kind of lacking on the other stuff. Well, hey, as a dog trainer, guess what? I need to train the dog in front of me. So maybe I do need to do birds earlier with that dog and open it up a little bit, give it some confidence, give it some excitement. I may have to later on go back and do more foundation work with that dog. But at the time, maybe birds were what it needed. But on the flip side, if I've got a dog that's hard charging, why give it, it's like giving sugar to a kid. Like why, that's not a good learning <laughs> mindset. Like there's a reason when our kids go to school, they don't like, hey, we're going to give you a, a sugar IV to get you going for the day. I like, love it. That's the last thing they need at school because it yeah. creates a chaos in their head. And the same thing for a dog. Kind of the same bird is a bird to a dog is kind of like sugar to a kid. It creates chaos inside their head. There you They're go. They're not in a good position to learn. I love it. So that that's I guess that's my theory behind our principle behind that. Like we don't give them more of a stimulant than than what is necessary. So if they'll work for a tennis ball, let's use that tennis ball and train what we can train. If the tennis ball isn't enough to get them going, maybe I do need a bigger stimulant. Maybe it's maybe it's a different tennis ball. You know, maybe it's a dummy that they mm-hmm, like. Maybe it's mm-hmm. a dummy with a wing tied to it. I find just enough stimulant to motivate them so I can teach them. And then after I've taught them, then I overlay like the ultimate stimulant, which would be a live bird. But that isn't coming until I I already know that the foundation is there. I know that the dog is going to come when I call it. I know that it's not going to grab the bird and run off with it. I know it's not going to chase the bird over the horizon and blow me off. You know, there's before I entrust them with a live bird, I have to, I have to trust that that dog has the right foundation. And on that note of trust, which comes from perception and observation we're going to have to call it a day jordan horak with cato outdoors in fact if you want to learn more about that great place board cato c-a-t-o outdoors.com we'll do this again because we've uh, kind of sort of scratched the surface a thorough scratching but uh we got a lot more to talk about so jordan thanks so much for joining us here at the upland nation podcast let's do it again sometime Sounds good. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Be safe. All right. You too. Bye. And we're going to cover a couple more things after a brief break. Uh, First, our Upland Nation glossary to the letter L. And I bet most of you won't know what this one stands for. Plus, a quick look at uh, your comments on who you wish you'd taken hunting one more time. It's all coming up in just a moment. First, a word from Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com is where you learn more about all the formulations for all types of dogs in all life stages. Free delivery, 30% off your first order if you use the code Upland Nation. There's my reminder. That's uh, perfect timing. Once in a while, it happens. And uh, next on the agenda, midvalleyclays.com. Yeah, located in central western Oregon. It's a shooting school. They're a gun dealer. So if you're looking for a shotgun and you can't find it somewhere else, give them a call. Midvalleyclays.com is where you shop for your next shotgun. Visit their website, click on the instruction tab, learn more about who's teaching whom out there. Whatever your shotgun game, whether it's hunting, five stand, fee task, you name it, they've got some incredible instructors there. Take your RV, visit for a day or two, shoot all the games and take a lesson. Learn more at midvalleyclays.com.
Yeah, so the Upland Nation Glossary available at findbirdhuntingspots.com. I'll be adding all of your kind and very useful suggestions for the letters we've come to so far. But right now we're up to L, several L's in that glossary. One that, uh, unless you're a serious trialer, may not know. Maybe you've seen the words, line, manners. And it means different things to different people, but basically... Line manners are how a dog acts while sitting at the line under judgment at a field trial. So uh, if you've watched a field trial, been in one, you know what I mean by that. It's the spot where everybody stops and starts almost everything in a field trial. Line manners are how your dog, well, handles itself right then and there. And I'm always fascinated with some of the, well, more philosophical questions I ask on our social media. And this one just really, well, it it covers a lot of ground for me and for um, many of you as well, clearly. Um, And it's kind of along the same lines as uh, many of the other things I'm doing these days to get you to take somebody else hunting for any number of reasons. In fact, if you want to learn more about why and how to get rewarded for that, go to fur feathersfriends.com so i asked anyway here's the question name someone you wish you'd taken hunting one more time and uh, thank you all for responding in such large numbers donald henderson wishes his grandmother had gotten a chance to see his bird dogs work well i understand that absolutely kevin dixon says his grandfather He loved dogs and quail hunting around his house, never had expensive anythings, and his dogs were all drops, he says. He'd have loved to have gone with these high-bred, big-running pointers in South Texas. Yeah, that's great. Lance Larson, your dad, hunting Sharpies and Huns, have him meet and hunt with my old Weimaraner, Mauser. Lucky enough to have met you both. Thank you so much for your support over the years. A lot of dads. Here's one. Laverne Ward, my father-in-law and his dog, Duke. We had so many good times together. I miss them. Grandfather for Bruce Wondrak, Dale Sweetser. Yeah, sweet spot for me as well. Any and all of my past dogs. And speaking of dogs of the past, my old lady, Sal. That's Gary Lewis's wish. If I had known our time was ending that weekend, that's a good one. Thank you all. Appreciate that. I wish I could cover all of them, but they're all at the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. You know where to go if you want to talk. That's one of the spots. Instagram now as well, and of course the Upland Nation Facebook page too. And on that note, touching... I'm going to turn you loose. I want to thank all of you who have listened so attentively. Thank you, Jordan Horak, for your observations and insights on dog training. Learn more about Jordan's work at CatoOutdoors.com. If you left a rating or a review, I sure appreciate it. If you are so inclined, please do that. It's how other people learn more about this podcast. So keep up the good work. I'll leave you with this from, well, one of the greatest comics I think of the 20th century, Rodney Dangerfield. He says, it's tough to stay married. You know, holding your tie as you do it. Remember, that's how he did it. My wife kisses the dog on the lips, but she won't drink from my glass. (laughs) Yeah, you don't get no respect, Rodney. No, you don't. Rest in peace, my friend. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. Until next week, maybe I'll see you on the dog training field. 